But, you know, when you look at loans, mortgage loans, you know, there's a few basic types, right? You have VA loans, you have conventional loans, you have FHA loans, like those are the three major ones, right? And when you look at those from a performance level, right? Like how do these loans perform, you know, way after the guys got the loan and they're making their payments and stuff, how do they perform in the portfolio for the lender? Like, you know, are they going into default quickly? Are they paying on time all the time? Like, what do these look like in the future? And that's really the statistic that is so glaring. The VA loan is the highest performing loan in all lenders portfolio, meaning it has the least missed payments, the least number of loan defaults, the least number of bad stuff happening once they own their home. Conventional loans are second place and they perform worse than VA loans, even though listing agents would perceive them to be a better buyer, right? Because here's someone bringing some down payment, whatever the amount is. So they perceive that to be better. And then FHA is in last place that, that has the highest level of default. So when you look at a buyer's profile and you compare, you know, what the average buyer looks like from a VA buyer to a conventional buyer an FHA buyer, the average VA buyer has a higher credit score than all three, has a higher level of education, believe it or not, and a higher median income, household income. So those are all three really important drivers when you're trying to analyze risk as a lender and determine how are these people going to pay back these hundreds of thousands of dollars that we're going to lend them, right? And I think people forget about that sometimes, right? You're, you're getting a mortgage, right? And it just becomes this kind of like, Blase term, but you're borrowing six figures, sometimes more, right? That's a lot of money, right? And if you had that cash in the bank, you might not want to spend it because that's a lot of money, right? So, you know, the banks, they look at this and they, they, they analyze risk and it's, it's in the bank's best interest to make VA loans. So for those that maybe are unfamiliar, what the, what is the role of the VA in this whole VA loan thing, right? You know, and that's, that's, that's not understood well. So the VA, think of the VA like Geico. They're thinking of them like an insurance company. So they're not getting in there and calculating income. They're not looking at your credit report. They're not doing any of that stuff. All the VA is doing is guaranteeing that loan to the lender. So they, they provide a 25% guarantee. So what that means to the bank or the mortgage lender is if you get a VA loan and then you quit making your payments, house gets foreclosed on, that all the lender has to do is go to the VA, say, hey, here's what happened. No questions asked, VA, boom, pops them a check, here's 25%, we're sorry, done. So the, the lenders are guaranteed that. So you know, even though perception with like listing agents is they got zero down, they're riskier, in the bank size, they're going, they're way safer because your conventional guy with 5% down or 10% down ain't nothing. I got a guy with 25% guaranteed if he bails on this thing. Like we're way safer doing this VA loan than we would be doing that conventional loan, for example. So, you know, it's, it's in the lender's best interest to do a VA loan over any other. And the VA actually incentivizes that to a degree with the mortgage lenders. So here's what it's going to take to get your loan guaranteed by the VA. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the only thing the lenders pay attention to, but they have to meet those basics, right? So if the lender can meet those basics, the VA will guarantee it. When you look at like a conventional loan, you have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who are the providers of guidelines and, you know, the money behind those conventional loans. They have a much more rigid set of guidelines or rules that have to be followed when it comes to debt ratios and credit scores and all sorts of things, right? VA's minimum requirements are, are much less. So there's less for lenders to have to meet when it comes to underwriting on a VA loan. So, you know, we tell people they're looser guidelines. They really are. The VA basically tells lenders if the underwriter can substantiate their decision in writing, the VA will guarantee it. Conventional loans, if the loan doesn't fit in the box, you're out. So two very different perspectives, right? And I think a lot of consumers and most real estate agents out there, especially who are not familiar with the VA loan, have no idea about this stuff. You know, you throw uh, the icing on the cake is, you know, what a good public image for a lender to be making lots of VA loans, right? That's, that's also another fringe benefit that comes with it. And that's important to the lenders. One of the reasons that I know that our other real estate agent friends don't like to accept or put that uh, they'll accept VA loan financing is because 
of the VA appraisal and mm-hmm. the certain things like uh, chipping and peeling paint and all of those other extra considerations. I think it, I've heard more objections because of that part of it and the timeline to get the appraisal done compared to the other inspections and stuff more so than, than the, the, Conventional. Uh, conventional loans and people bringing uh, less money to the table. It's it's that that appraisal part that the listing agents have a problem mm-hmm. with more so than uh, it's f- f- my experience. Than the- and that's what scares me for sure, especially because the last few houses we had, they were older houses. Mm-hmm. So there were issues that we had to get fixed to make them VA qualified. Mm-hmm. And yeah. if you could speak to maybe a little bit of that, that would really be great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's That's a really common one. So we have to kind of back up to like, what is the, what's the purpose? Why did they create this VA loan? Right. So, you know, generally speaking, I mean, the VA loan was created for the GIs coming back from world war II, Right. So they could acclimate to civilian life and have a home. And so the VA decided, okay, well, we're going to create this so they can own a piece of land. They just fought so hard to defend. Right. And we're going to make it a zero down payment and all these great perks. So as part of their creation of this, they wanted to make sure that the veteran that was buying this home was not going to be put in a financial hardship because of the maintenance or upkeep of the home. So like the VA loan, for example, is a terrible loan. If you've got a total fixer, that's not the good loan, right? <laughs> it doesn't so work at all. The yeah. VA appraiser is going to chew that into a thousand pieces. So it's not the loan. Even if you got a veteran who's super duper handy, the financing isn't going to work. So, so you got to understand the why behind the reason they made this. And so they, they made this part of the handbook called the minimum property requirements, the NPRs. And that's what the appraisers are adhering to. But basically to dumb it down, it says, look, this house has to be free of health and safety related issues. They don't want a veteran buying this house that's going to put them in harm's way or more of a financially hardship, right? So that's the pretense behind it so that they we understand. So when you look at the appraisers, you know, the appraisers that are going out and doing VA appraisers are the same guys and gals who are doing the conventional appraisers down the street. And the FHA I mean, want to block. I mean, I away. It's were, the same people, the same, yeah, same human beings, right? They're just approved with the VA to do those. So the VA has a couple extra requirements. They got to do a little bit more on the report, just a little bit more, but they have to have their eyes out for these other things, right? So peeling paint, like that's a pretty common one, right? And people go, oh, it's just peeling paint. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, you know, now you've opened the wood up to moisture, mm-hmm. right? Moisture can cause all sorts of havoc on wood, right? It can lead to dry rot, can lead to mold, structural issues. Like there can be a laundry list or domino effect of things that can happen by moisture getting onto exposed wood. So the VA, going back to their minimum property requirements, wants a home that's not going to create an issue for health or safety, right? So that's a really common one. And, you know, it's it's a conversation. I think if you're a real estate agent, you're representing the buyer, you know, if you've, if you've done enough you have kind of an eye for this stuff. You know, when you're showing the homes to the client, you know, the real estate agent's less concerned with carpet and drape colors, but really should be looking at, okay, where do I see an opportunity for something to be flagged on this appraisal, right? Because, you know, some of the stuff, even though it might be a pain in the neck, a lot of it's pretty simple. You know, like, I mean, I have appraisers flag things for not having a smoke detector. Mm -hmm. Like, really? I mean, run in 20 minutes of a trip to Home Depot, we can have that fixed right? So let's fix it before the appraiser gets there, right? Like simple, right? Peeling paint, another thing, like the listing agent should know that there's peeling paint out there, right? And if you're in a highly dense and densely concentrated area of military, well, a good listing agent should know, hey, maybe just notes in the MLS, we got peeling paint, that's going to be an issue with the VA, seller's not willing to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Okay, fair enough. Now, when you go to show a buyer, and you see those notes, you go, I know you're gonna love this house, but it ain't going to happen unless you want to pay for it out of your pocket. But they're already saying here they know it exists and they're not touching it. Mm-hmm. That's fair, right? That's fair. At least we know what we're getting into, right? And it's not like this big rub. But I think that's like a good prepared agent is that stuff. But yeah, like- you know, a lot of these things are simple fixes. Like I see missing covers over the, the plugs on the wall. I mean, what is that? 39 cents at Home Depot and a screwdriver? Like, yeah. But we're going we're gonna to slow down an entire purchase transaction because no one saw that and took care of it. I mean, who cares who's responsible for paying for it if it's less than a dollar, really? Right. I mean, yeah. let, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's be honest. You know, we got a $400,000 transaction and we're going to, you know, mm, get held up over a couple bucks. Right. I mean, come on. So a lot of the things are simple. And, you know, can they run into some bigger items? Yeah. Yeah, they can. But I think, you know, in the instance where you run into some big items, 
that's that's a big oops on both realtors mm-hmm. of missing something major, right? That is going to be some catastrophic event to the whole deal. You know, that might have been a video showing and that's it. And that's unfortunate and it happens, but most of the time they're small things. So it's not, it's not something, and I try and explain that to listing agents when, you know, when my clients make an offer, I follow up with a phone call and talk to them. And, you know, a lot of times they will have that concern. And so I'll just ask them, tell me about the condition of this place. What do you think about this house? Have you walked it? Are we missing any baseboards? No. Did they do a DIY project on flooring and not finish a transition piece anywhere? No. Does it have stairs? Yeah. Did you check the banister? Yeah. Is it solid? Okay. Do we have peeling paint? Do we have a termite issue? You know, do we have, you know, dry rot? Do we have, you know, have you visibly seen anything, any of these things? I run through kind of the gamut with them and they're like, no, I'm like, you're not gonna have a problem unless there's something you're not telling anybody. So yeah, most of it's, most of it is kind of fear-based, right? They're just worried that this VA appraiser is going to come out there and just, you know, pick apart this house. And if you've got a lot of those little things, they will pick those apart. Mm -hmm. But like I mentioned, most of them are pretty simple. You know, sometimes like the water heater isn't strapped. I mean, another quick Home Depot fix, but they're going to call that out. It's not safe. Right. Yeah, those are those are all good things. And I think especially for our investors that are doing the fix and flip type rehabs where they're coming in, they're fixing them up. All of this information is really good because those are things that they can look through, look at on their final inspection once the rehab's been done, especially in a military town. You know that there's a chance that, that you're going to be selling to those military people or if you want to target those military people around the bases, that you need to cover those things. So going to find that that VA handbook and, and being able to identify those before you even before you even list it those those things really should be done if you're doing that kind of stuff so i think that's really good information and um, they can they can print that out it's free you know just go online I, th- I think one of the points that I really w- think is going to be good for our investors is a lot of the military guys that i know the way that i started um, my investing career was using the va loan as part of a house hack and and doing that and I know that recently within the last, I think it's the last year and a half, they've changed some of the way that they, they tell you, you know, how you can get more than one VA loan and the county limits and all of that kind of stuff. Can we go into talking about that a little bit? And I, yeah. I'm sure I'll have some questions uh, as it comes. What it used to be was as long as you were under your county limit, you could get another VA loan. And, and I know that some of those things have changed, but I'm not very familiar with them. I'm hoping you can help me figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a question I get quite a bit. So part of that question is, you know, how many VA loans or how many times can I use my VA loan? Mm -hmm. And the answer is it is unlimited as far as the number of times that you can use it. So, you know, what's common, you know, for us that we're serving, you know, we hear from a guy in our shop that knows, you know, a tiny, tiny bit about VA loans and goes, Hey, save it for the big family home. You can only use it once. Right. I mean, that's, that's a very common thing. I think a lot of us in the military have heard of, which is not the truth, but you know, people just don't know. And that's, you know, that's okay. But the VA loan, we did have a really big change on the VA loan, which went into effect January of 2020. So that previous summer, the Trump administration passed the, uh, the Navy Blue Water Act. So what that act did is it really helped serve um, the veteran community for those that were in kind of the Korea and the Vietnam era. Right. And a lot of those veterans were exposed to chemical agents Mm -hmm. and they weren't provided medical care at the VA hospitals if they had exposure to that stuff. So it was just we got the segment of veterans who are suffering from some of this stuff. No care. Right. And, uh, and And he realized it and obviously wanted to do something about it. So this act extended care to them. But, you know, when you add a huge population that's not going to get free medical care, we have other residual impacts of that, which namely our cost, right? So how do we pay for this was kind of the next question. So how they paid for it is they use the VA loan. So the VA loan, you know, everyone is probably where has the VA funding fee, right? And mm-hmm. uh, there's different levels of that and you can have it, uh, you can be exempt from it and so forth. But anyways, the VA funding fee, what they did is they increased it a little bit on all the different levels to help pay for this. And then they also removed the county loan limits nationwide. So we have no more loan limit. So if you can qualify for a gazillion dollar VA loan, then you can get a gazillion dollar VA loan, no doubt, right? So that's, that's in theory what's available. So they figured, okay, if the funding fee is up just a hair and we take the ceiling off this thing and people that can qualify for more are financing more, 
well, that multiple is going to end up as more dollars to the VA. So here's how we pay for the medical care, right? So it makes some sense. And so it's added a really cool benefit. What it didn't change is the way that entitlement is calculated for using like your VA loan the next time. And I don't mean the next time, like I sold a house, buy a new house. I mean, right. I bought a house. Now I'm going to keep it as a rental, go buy another one, but I want to use VA on both. That, that calculation hasn't changed. So that calculation is based off of entitlement. So this is going to get kind of geeked out for people, but so entitlement, right? This is that 25% guarantee number that the VA provides, right? So we take a home, let's say it's a $400,000 home, right? Well, the the entitlement that's guaranteed to the bank is a quarter of that, right? So $100,000 is guaranteed to the bank. So that's the entitlement that is now being used or charged, I guess, to the, to the veteran's certificate, right? So it's got that much used up. So in the instance where, hey, I bought a house a few years back, I'm now going to get PCS orders across the country. I want to buy another house, do two VA loans. It's entirely possible. So the way that that math is done, however, is we have to know, A, the county that you're moving to, because now the county loan limits come back to the equation. Right. So now we implement using those and we have to also pull the certificate of eligibility and see how much entitlement has been charged. So we go to a county in the country and, you know, we got the county loan limit. And so we figure out what's the entitlement available in that county. So 25%, right? And then we have to subtract what's already been used. So if we've used a hundred grand and in this county, we've got 200 available, we've got a hundred left just theoretically. And now we got to figure out what, how much VA loan can I get now if I've got a hundred grand in entitlement for zero down, which you'd multiply by four. So in that really rough example, you could buy a home for 400,000 zero down in that rough example. And you can go over that, that's just zero down payment. So you could go higher and have some down payment and put, you know, and then it goes back to like the old rule. Remember, mm -hmm. if you went over the county limit in the past, it was 25% of the difference, you know, right. for every dollar. So then that, that game and that rule, that playbook comes back when you're trying to get home number two or home number three on a VA loan that comes back into play. Are the, is, so be, because they got rid of the county loan limits in regards to purchasing your first VA loan, are they still updating those county loan limits? Because every year or every couple of years, those limits change based off of the average price of the house. But now that they're not using those to calculate, are we stuck in the 20, January 20 county loan limits? Or do they still update that? Or is that completely separate from, from this part? Yeah, so it's it's updated every year. The VA has actually never been the one that puts that out. So the Department of Housing and Urban Development is the one that puts that out. Gotcha. That Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA mm -hmm. and everybody go off of. So yeah, that gets updated every year. So, you know, it's probably going to go up every year. So those limits will go up too. Great. That's, uh, that's really yeah. awesome. Um, it's, it's pretty cool.